for those who don't know me, my name is Jan Gro, G R O H, and um, I am a Portland native, which I think actually makes me more rare than having hypermobile EDS, frankly. Um, I do give autographs. <laughs> so being a Portland native and having hypermobile EDS might make me rare, but I don't think having hypermobile EDS makes me rare. <clears throat> and I can't say enough how thrilled we are to have so many people attending today um, from all over, not just Portland and Oregon, but literally from as far as Las Vegas and New York, because our goal today is to bring awareness and, and support and camaraderie to everyone, whether you're diagnosed or not, especially those suspecting, because I, that journey is just so challenging and hard. With that, what is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? Golly gosh. Well, I'm guessing that most of you know, but for those who are, are wondering, and that's my target audience, is those who suspect or are wondering or trying to find out on behalf of a loved one, and even for those who know, it is actually a collection of genetic collagen defects that I like to say is not rare. It's rarely diagnosed. Now that is subject to opinion. Um, I'll explain, hold that thought. The zebra is our mascot. We call ourselves zebras because the saying goes, allegedly, that in medical school, doctors are trained to, upon hearing hoofbeats behind them, to think and diagnose horses, the more common horses, at least in the Western world, as opposed to the less common other possibility, a zebra. And so we have co-opted that rare disease mascot. Um, and so you'll see a lot of zebra stripes and, and zebra symbols to represent us. And we'll, when I, you, I'll use the term to, to zebras instead of Ehlers-Danlos patients. It's also easier to on the tongue. <laughs> it's part of the family of heritable disorders of connective tissue. There's several other disorders of connective tissue. So all of the variations of Ehlers-Danlos involve collagen, different types of collagen. Um, some people will just have a very long, slow, gradual onset and have one or two problem joints. You might have a trick neck or a trick knee or a trick hip. Um, or elbow, you might have tendonitis, and or you might have several joints that trouble you. It just, the onset is all over the map. And I'm going to try to arm you with ways of knowing when to suspect for those who are wondering. Now, there are six main types that the Professional Advisory Network of the Ehlers-Danlos National Foundation would like us to um, recognize and refer to. And they are asking us to now start using the descriptive terms, which are on the left side. I have included the old numbering system because I'm guilty. When I first learned about, you know, got deeply involved just over a year ago, most people said, oh, I'm type 3, I'm type 4. You know, you'll hear people say, I'm a, I'm a 3, I'm a 4. You'll hear very few 7s, A, B, or C, because these first five types are indeed rare. The first three type, dermatospraxis, arthrochalasia, and kyphoscoliotic, are extremely rare. So to doctor's credits, yes, some types are incredibly rare, and you're not apt to see them. They are, we are true zebras. I think there's only one family that has dermatospraxis, if I'm not mistaken, but this can all be looked up. I've listed some of the key signs only. There's many other signs, and you'll want to read on our website and go to the Ehlers-Danlos National Foundation site to learn much more about all of these and when to suspect the different kinds. Because I need to move on to the sixth type, but I want to first say a word about the, the fourth one down in red. I hope it appears red to you. Vascular, type four, because um, doctors should rightly be concerned if you do suspect vascular type, I would get the test to rule it out. There are single tissue markers for all of these five rare types. For some of them, there is a, a um, skin biopsy that can be done. And for others, there is a blood test that I believe Dr. Byers' lab is the one who performs to rule those in or out clearly. It's, it's you either have it or you don't. Now, just because you might be negative for one of those rare types doesn't mean you don't have Ehlers-Danlos. Um, and classical is the least rare of the rare types. It's maybe one in 20,000 to 30,000 people, I'm not sure. But a lot of us find we can't decide whether we're classical or this last type, um, hypermobile type. But in the milder cases, which often have a lot of cl cr crossover with classical, that's why I said sometimes classical is hard to distinguish and it's not really a big deal whether you have classical or hypermobile. It's still benign. You're not probably not going to die. All of us can have any of the signs of any of the other types. There's a lot of crossover. 
you know, and you, you, in the end, you have to mitigate your own issues as they present whatever they are, whether you're diagnosed or not. Um, you can still be treated. You know, my aunt is 89, and she's gone all her whole life without being diagnosed. She's very clear, a clear case in hindsight. But, you know, so in the end, your treatment's the same. It just helps to know sometimes. So you have the diagnostic criteria in front of you. You can either pass both major criteria, which is the Byton scale of four or greater, or a lot of joint pain for three or more months in four or more joints, and you're in. You can either pass either one of those major criteria and any two minor criteria that don't match. The top two minor criteria are the same as the major criteria, only less a lower threshold. So they're restated. So if you pass that one major criteria, you have to skip its matching minor and go into the others. This is all spelled out here. I'm not going to run it any further than that. Um, but I hope it's clear that you do not have to be bendy, really bendy, to have hypermobile EDS. And so your doctors should know about the Brighton diagnostic criteria and refer you to a geneticist to get diagnosed. Um, some common orthopedic problems, I'm going to skirt through the beginning of this to save time, but 70% of people with um, Ehlers-Danlos will at some point have TMJ or the jaw joint uh, dysfunction or pain, um, neck pain and headaches, tension headaches or migraines, um, unstable segments, meaning that a joint moves a little too far, more than it's supposed to, um, or herniations like a disc, you hear about disc bulges or that kind of thing are very common in the neck. Um, shoulders oftentimes will sublux, dislocate, um, big fancy PT word is multi-directional instability, meaning that it goes in any direction it wants to go whenever it wants to. And so it's a really common PT diagnosis we see a lot, um, but we'll find with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is you can have multi-directional instability of anything. <laughs> um, and so that can be overwhelming to the PT um, as well as the patient, because um, it's like, what's walking in today? So. Um, elbow tendonitis is very common. Um, early onset arthritis in the hands is very common and the feet. Uh, rib subluxation, um, especially repeated ones at certain levels, is a really common problem. Um, it tends to be associated with um, a higher uh, tendency for a fight or flight syndrome being set off, which I can spend a whole lecture on alone. The fact is that it's a human being who is sick. It's not an animal. I mean, we have cats and dogs and we love them to death, but you know what? They don't have careers. They don't have, you know, uh, affiliations. They don't have a sense of self-identity, which is usually for we human beings based largely on our connections in life, what we're able to do. Our sense of self is central to, the, to uh, solving the equation of how to deal with a condition like this. Um, one of the things I'll mention is our cultural legacy, our tradition of mind-body dualism, which you may have heard about. Uh, we're born into a culture, and certainly our, our medical and healthcare systems are um, adapting the idea that mind and body are separate. You can have a physical illness or a mental illness. And we've built a whole <clears throat> medical structure, medical system based on that assumption. Well, um, in my former role as president of the American Academy of Clinical Health Psychology, one of the things that we did, this was back uh, in the early 2000s, <clears throat> we created a position statement saying it's time to retire mind-body dualism because we know, and the research supports this more and more, that mind, body, and I would argue spirit, are intricately intertwined. Um, we know that through our research, we know that prolonged uh, or chronic exposure to physiological or emotional stress suppresses immune function. It inhibits the healing process. So think about this. As the person grows into adulthood, there are things that we can do to elicit support. What if that support's not there? What if we come down with a life changing illness that disrupts our capacity to function, to work, to you know, live our lives normally. What happens? Well, the natural human response is to feel stress, unbalance. And what do we do about it? 
we communicate that unbalance, hopefully, to the people around us. And what is the response that we should get? We should get validation, but we don't always get that. So let's say you go to the doctor who has never heard of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or has never heard of, or is, is uh, skeptical of fibromyalgia or any other kind of disorder that is life-changing, life-altering. How do you feel? Has anybody here ever, ever gone to a doctor or healthcare provider of any type who was skeptical? Um, time and again, they would go in seeking help and they would hear the same thing over and over. And that is, it's, you know, we can't find anything wrong. And the implication was, by the way, it's all in your head. And I argue again, and it's important, it's important to me to get across to my patients. No, you are not too sensitive. You may be more sensitive than people in your, in your life, your parents, your siblings, your significant other. Uh, and that's oftentimes the case. There's this mismatch of sensitivity. Um, but seeking and obtaining proper validation for your experience of suffering is vitally important. I think you all know that. Those that are you know, dealing, struggling with, with some of these symptoms, you know that. You know how it feels when somebody is supportive, listening, tuned in, versus when somebody blows you off. Don't let your healing be dependent upon others' recognition or validation of your experience. This is a hard one, but it's one that many people bump up against. That being that others in their lives don't really get it. Or maybe they're tired of hearing about the problems you're having. Or maybe you're perceiving that they're giving you that message. And some people are giving that message. I will recommend for those that are open to expansive ways of thinking, I will recommend talk to your body. Talk to your body respectfully but firmly. Um, imagine yourself as your body's boss and then and, and that your cells are awaiting your guidance. Here's the theory. We all know that cells divide, right? They, they live their life, they do their thing, but before they die, they will divide and replicate themselves. The theory is this. Unless given instructions to do otherwise, the cell will divide in exactly the same way as it did before. So, if you give your cells and the DNA in your cells instructions, hey, look, I, I want to achieve, re-achieve my sense of balance and health. Imagine it in your mind, get a picture of it, you know, of perhaps the way you used to function. Because, you know, there's memory in, inside of your nervous system that does remember that stuff. Get a picture of it, how you would like to be able to feel and function and be in life. Imagine it and then send a memo all at once to every cell in your body. Look, this is what I want you to help me achieve. Okay, so the idea is, and it sounds, it sounds crazy and nutty, but I think that there's a logical reason that you know, this could perhaps help. And anecdotally, I've seen it help a lot of people. But the idea is that you're giving instructions to the cells to perhaps divide or replicate itself a little bit differently in support of this vision of who I want to be. This is the big recommendation. Never, ever beat yourself up. Mass cell activation syndrome is what they call it when you test negative for actual mastocytosis, which I'll explain in just a minute, but you, ha you still suffer from all the same issues and symptoms. Um, and it can be very um, show-stopping. Mast cells are sentinel cells. They line, they're part of our immune system. They line all of our external facing tissues. So your skin, your, your, your nasal passages, your eyes, your ear passages, and your GI tract from lips to tail, all the way through. And I said external facing surfaces, and you might think, but my, my GI tract is inside me. Yes, but we take in outside substances and enter them into our system. So it's still an external facing system, right? 
So they're there to, quote, ward off, you know, things like parasites and, and whatnot. You know, they do serve, actually. Uh, they're really our friends, and we should talk to them and, and, you know, try to win them over and tell them to stop being trigger happy. What happens is people with mastocytosis have kind of a, it's a, it's a I think the word is neoplastic um, something or other, which, uh, you know, kind of like in cancer, they produce too many mast cells. They may have a, a cloning issue, and they'll have more than the average number of mast cells lining parts of their body and parts of their organs. And they can actually, you can get, you know, you may not have mastocytosis everywhere in your body. You may have it just in a certain organ or in a particular patch of your GI tract, and so you might get upper and lower endoscopies, and you might have to go through several of those before they finally hit the gold mine and find the hot patch in your body. The most, as Dr. Afrin says, pathognomonic, meaning telltale, um, test is a, is a bone marrow biopsy. With mastocytosis, and there's several kinds, systemic, uh, indolent smoldering, cutaneous, there's some others, those folks have an increased number of mast cells that may also be trigger happy. They, they fire too easily. And they're waiting with these little antennae for certain proteins to float by, and, and they, they'll fire off too quickly and easily. They're hyperadrenergic, if you will. In mast cell activation syndrome, we may not have an increased number of mast cells anywhere in our body, but our cells may still be extremely trigger happy. This isn't well known yet, so I'm happy to be helping spread the, quote, gospel of mast cell activation syndrome and raising awareness of it. But with mastocytosis, hey, I could at least start with a bone marrow biopsy, and then if that's negative, we might do a couple endoscopies. And if those are negative, we'll test for some mediators. They always probably test for mediators. Mast cells are big blobby cells with a bunch of little, little packets inside, little granules. And those little suckers are loaded <laughs> to the gills with what are called mediators. Mediators think chemicals. They're, they're proteins and chemicals. And th that's what makes us sick when they degranulate, when they either break open fully, that's full anaphylaxis, when it fully degranulates. That's a level five throat closing, system shutting. We're taking you down. Um, you need to go to the ER, you need to epi. More common is, is a, a lower level incident, you might leak some mediators. And so you'll still have a body and a system full of you know, histamine and leukotriene and prostaglandin D2 and, and some other things that it's making you sick. And you get this huge histamine load. You know, the standard protocol for both groups, like H1 and H2 blockers, that's a fancy way of saying antihistamines. GI symptoms are extremely common. So you know, if you're a zebra and you have IBS or any form of IBS, or you're prone to gas and bloating or diarrhea, um, and it flips easily. Um, that fl quick flip to, uh, to diarrhea, I now know what's causing that. It was, it was triggers. And, you know, now that makes sense. Um, fatigue, extremely common. And not just any fatigue. Um, you need to be careful if you're getting what I call walloped. That is an official medical term. I wanted to introduce us and tell you who we are. So I'm Peter Byers. I'm a medical geneticist at the University of Washington. Um, and Mitzi Murray is over here. She's also a medical geneticist and a, a clinical molecular geneticist at the University of Washington. We are two of the three people who direct the Collagen Diagnostic Laboratory. I know some of you have come to Seattle and have seen us. We actually um, run, a, a, as part of our molecular uh, me genetic medicine clinic at the University of Washington. We are actually active physicians who uh, were trained as doctors, and we actually see people. We talk to people, and we spend time with them and try to make uh, diagnoses. So it's, it's part of what we do, and it's, uh, we don't just run a laboratory. We actually do all, all the other kinds of things. The laboratory is an adjunct uh, as well, the diagnostic laboratory, for um, identifying uh, problems to work on and, and problems to solve. And probably the easiest way to tell you what we do in the diagnostic laboratory is what we're trying to figure out is how and why one change in one DNA building block out of three billion that you have in your body is enough to make the difference between you feeling well and feeling not well. So the rules are very simple. Each Ehlers-Danlos syndrome type is a distinct condition it's separate. It has mutations in one gene. There may be many mutations along the gene, and each person may have a unique mutation, 
but it's always in the same gene, and it's that gene and those mutations that define that form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Each type has mutations in one gene. Now, manifestations of different mutations in the same gene may vary, and we call that variable expression. And you'll see an example of that for mutations in the type 3 collagen gene, which give rise to the vascular form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Certain classes of mutations give rise to mild clinical presentations, where sometimes people can be 70 or 80 and have no clinical manifestations, and other people in the family present early on. But they all have mutations in the same gene, but this variable expression. And even in the same family, even with other kinds of mutations, you can see variation. Well, why would that be? Well, look around the room. There's not one of you in here that looks the same. Mm -hmm.